Good morning, Oaks live stream family. Tuesday morning, May what? May 12th. Uh, so time is flying by for us. It was a beautiful sunrise this morning. I had to go in and get a blood test at 5.30, and wow, the sun was beautiful, and now it's kind of clouded over, but man, I was that was the most beautiful drive in and back this morning, so praise God for the sunshine. It is out there. Hope the clouds break away, and we get to enjoy it a little bit. Uh, can you say flowers in, flowers out, flowers in, flowers out, <laughs> flowers in, flowers out? Yeah, that that's kind of what we've been going through. Uh, numerous times here the past few days, I was telling Joy, I said, is this the last time? You think this is the last time? I'm praying that last night was the last time and summer is coming and is here. We won't have to take the flowers in and the flowers out. I uh, want to apologize for my uh, political ramblings yesterday. Uh, my executive producer has uh, tightened the reins on me a little bit. Uh, but I do have feelings. Uh, I I do want I do want us to. Okay, enough. Anyway, uh, so she told me to get a big bottle, and and hang another bottle. So anyway, I didn't think I mentioned people's names. Apparently, I did. Uh, so I apologize for that. Please forgive me. Uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, let's let's get. Oh, a happy thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. Happy thought. I got one for you today. Wait till you see this one. Remember the robins in our in our backboard, the robin with her nest, but out in the wide o out in the open where it just rains in it and everything else. But she obviously knows what she's doing. Look there at the picture I took yesterday. Look at those little fuzzy things. Can you see them? Yeah, they're all cuddled up in there just a little fuzz on them uh so we'll watch them grow and uh i hope when they jump out they don't land on the blacktop and hurt themselves but i got a feeling like they got that figured out too right but what a wonderful little thing are the little robins there in our in our backboard i don't know how long it takes from here uh but you know we're looking forward to getting being able to play basketball again anyway. So, uh, all right, let's get into Romans 11. And, uh, wow, what an immersion we are having into the most systematic, uh, difficult <laughs> uh, book in the Bible. The most beautiful and the most, or some say the most beautiful and the most difficult um, I was talking to Dick Carlson. He was talking about Bill Barnes when he used to teach Bible study. And he made the comment when they were going through Romans to go, we could just do with just Romans as our only book. And I can't go that far because I'm a red letter man. But uh, anyway, you know, Bill's got a point. I think Martin Luther said that Romans is the, mo is the purest gospel. And uh, uh, he truly loved it. And of course, he got saved uh, and reading Romans 3 and understanding justification by faith. Justification by faith is what? Justification means to be put in a right relationship with God. That's righteousness. To be made righteous, to be in a right relationship with God. How? Through faith. And so we've been there. We've been all over it and over it. And we're in this little section right now where Paul's heart uh, for the Jewish people, his people, uh, he just has a kind of a, I don't know what to call it, if it's an interlude or what it is, but for three chapters here, 9, 10, and 11, uh, he just goes on and on and just builds this case of his love and God's love uh, for the Jewish people. And of course, we're from the Gentiles, you know, we're kind of along for the ride here. And uh, today uh, we look at his last chapter uh, on on the Jewish and Gentile uh, coming together, ultimately. It's really a beautiful, uh, beautiful chapter. It's, uh, I, I won't do it a lot of justice, I'm sure, but I'm going to go through it anyway with you. And so, if nothing else, we'll read every word in it, and that'll be worth something. Uh, so, yesterday, uh, God never gives up. That's how we ended uh, chapter 
uh, 10, God, uh, he never gives up uh, on his people, never has. And we had all those quotes from the, the Old Testament quotes. I think we had 11 of them. Uh, let me see. I think 11. Yeah. And there's seven today uh, here in, in chapter 11. Okay. Paul says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? And here, this is a reference to the Jewish people, okay? Because yesterday we talked about all this prof prophecy about the Gentiles. Uh, and this is not a new thing, that the Gentiles are going to come to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And he, he looks at all kind of prophets and prophecies in Deuteronomy. I went back there several times. Just again, just reinforcing to us, this is Old Testament Theology coming to completion uh, here in Christ. Hallelujah. It's just beautiful. Uh, but now, since he set all that up, the Gentiles, are, it's prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament and Deuteronomy that they're going to come uh, to saving faith in Christ. So Paul, you know, one last thing here. God, God is not, now doesn't mean he's left his people behind, the Jewish nation. Okay, God has not rejected his people, has he? And here's that word, may it never be. May genoika, genoitas. He, may it never be, not to be. May is not. Uh, genomai is to be. May genoita. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, Paul saying, wait, ho, oh, no, he hasn't rejected his people. If he did, I couldn't be, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be writing this. I am a descent, I am an Israelite. And look, he has not rejected me. And he can, he can name others and we will name others uh, here uh, as we go on. Paul hasn't been rejected. Verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Now, I think this is very important in verse 2. That Paul's going to make an argument here for the remnant. God's remnant people. God always has a remnant. He could have used pretty much any prophet he wanted to. Because I think almost every prophet talks about God's remnant of people. Yes, a majority or many, many have gone astray or don't get it or their heart is hard, it's uncircumcised, but there's always a remnant and every prophet builds on that idea that the remnant is always present. But Paul, he doesn't choose Isaiah whom he has used to death. <laughs> through, not, no, 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 he doesn't. Go, he goes all the way back to the first well, not the first prophet. Moses, I think, was called a prophet. Uh, but I, I guess we would say the prophets, prophets uh, proper that we think of. And Elijah was the first one. Because he wants to go all the way back and, and let us know that this is, this is a part of the message of the prophets from the very beginning. And it's beautiful that he uses Elijah. We're all familiar with the story. Uh, verse 3 quoting Elijah, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him, Paul says? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. This is remnant theology. I'm calling it remnant theology. I don't know what they call it, but uh, there's always a remnant. And Elijah, you're clueless, man. You think you're it. You're not it. You're not the only one. There's 7,000. Not 6,999. There's 7,000, Elijah. I count every one of them. And that's the men and uh, I don't know, we could include women and children, many. 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So anytime that you think you're the only one, 
did a little correction here. I think that would be our our take for us today. Uh, you think the only one that gets it or the only one that's got this part or that part? Nah. No, don't go there. Uh, God's God's got this, okay? <laughs> and he's got this. There's 7,000 of them. And uh, it's the same way. Uh, verse 5, Paul says, In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. And there is a remnant. And Paul, you know, Paul's part of the remnant. Uh, Peter's part of the remnant. John's part of the remnant. The twelve, all, they're all part of that, the, the remnant. They're all Jews who come to Christ. There's 5,000 of them uh, there that first uh, at Pentecost. Or then there's 120 uh, also uh, there in the upper room. That's, that's the remnant. Those are all Jews. And then the 5,000. I don't know. I think most of them are Jews. Uh, might be a few proselytes in there, but they're mostly Jews. They're all part of this, the remnant that Paul is talking about here. God always has his remnant. God has pulled out his remnant, and they've come to Christ. And it's all according to his gracious choice. Verse 6, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. This remnant has come by grace, uh, not by works. And Paul's not going to change his theology in any way uh, for the Jews, for his people. Because there's only one way now, and it is through Christ and Christ alone. And that's why in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, I think maybe we memorized those verses also uh, when we did our topical memory system. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's the gift of god not of works let's anyone should paul never backs down even a particle from that bedrock truth of salvation and that's why here with the grace three occurrences of it grace 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 and again grace is what g-r-a-c-e god's riches at christ's expense and it's unmerited God's <clears throat> unmerited riches at Christ's expense amen verse 7 what then what Israel is seeking it has not obtained but those who were chosen obtained it and the rest <clears throat> were hardened he really gets into some stuff here now uh, you know God pulling out and God, and Paul's one of them I mean he was a million miles uh, from the grace side uh, of salvation through Christ. But look what happened when Paul, when God chose him and appeared to him, Jesus appeared to him. And uh, so Paul, and that's what's happened with everyone who has come uh, to faith. That's what's happened with us. You're part of the chosen. Hallelujah. Bless God. Praise him. Uh, those who were chosen obtained it. The rest were hardened, just as it is written now he's going to quote Isaiah and Deuteronomy. Uh, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. And, and I know he's talking about <clears throat> here the Jewish people. Uh, but I think of kind of bringing it into our modern uh, day, into this contemporary uh, theology. I think of all the sermons I heard, my mom making us be in church, setting in church, and staying in church basically till I was 18 years old. How many sermons did I hear and I did not get it? This was me. I had a spirit of stupor. Eyes to see not and ears to hear not. Uh, down to the very day uh, when I finally, uh, I don't, God unhardened my heart and helped me and let me receive uh, his salvation uh, by grace through faith. I think of as a pastor how many stories I have heard and I think Emmaus is one of the, the main ones where I, where I hear this uh, when I'll listen to the testimonies on Sunday evening there when people get up and how many older people I have heard testify that Christ came into their life and they have been saved. 
and I, I don't know, I've probably heard maybe 20 or 30 or more of those over the 23 years that Joni and I have been sponsoring people uh, to walk to Emmaus. And all I can think every time is, oh man, I've preached like 48 sermons a year to you and you're in the church and you didn't get it. <laughs> Darn it. But you come to Emmaus for three days and you got it and you got saved, right? Uh, so anyway, well, they had a spirit of stupor. Eyes, uh, even, you know, I'm preaching, and but they, they eyes to see not and ears to hear not. Uh, but finally they got it. So praise God, all right? Yeah. Uh, verse 9, David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Oh, some tough stuff there. Uh, the prophets really, they... They tell it like it is, and I'm not sure that if that's Deuteronomy, uh, that part of that's from Deuteronomy also. Verse 11, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be another may genoita. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. <laughs> Whoa, what? What a what Paul has the Lord has revealed to him uh, an angle that you never would have thought of uh, on your own, right? Uh, to make them jealous. Can you say favorable and attractive witness? Yeah, that's kind of the same thing, isn't it? The same, you know, you want to be a favorable and attractive witness to all to almost make a person jealous to say, what do you got? I was like, I want that. I mean, in other words, they say, I'm jealous of that. You seem to have joy that I don't have. Even in the midst of trouble, you have joy. And you seem to, there's a, there's a bounce in your step that I don't have. And that, that's a favorable and attractive witness. Just, uh, I, I don't, I kind of use in Paul's language to, to make them uh, jealous. And, you know, I think about that, and, or they can think, uh, Wow, you can go out and have a good night and you don't have to get a drunk as a skunk or high as a whatever and you get up in the morning and you feel good. I get up in the morning and I can't stand it. Yeah, well, that's a favorable and attractive witness. Just helping me think, you know what? There's a better way. There's another way. Let me tell you about it. Verse 12. Now if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? So anyway, Paul is just saying, by, by their uh, transgression, by rejecting uh, Christ, that means Christ, you know, we have taken Christ to the Gentiles. And so that means riches for them. Riches for the world, riches for the Gentiles, is what he's saying. And their failure is riches for the Gentiles. How much more will their fulfillment be? So now he's going to kind of tip it here uh, after, well, he's going to eventually here. I'll keep going. I'm messing myself up. Verse 13. I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch then, as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, because Paul's ministry, remember, how many times did he say, okay, since you reject, he says to the Jews, so since you reject the message, we're going to go to the Gentiles. And of course, that's from the beginning. Uh, Jesus said, I'm going to send you uh, to the Gentiles. So that magnifies Paul's ministry. Uh, their rejection, the Jewish rejection, just magnifies his ministry. Just brings more and more Gentiles to faith. Verse 14, If some t somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. Paul's hoping that the Gentile favorable and attractive witness will move uh, the Jews to say, hey, look what they've got. They're worshiping our God, and they're loving it, and they are free to be obedient. It's not rules and regulations for them. It's coming right out of their heart. Now, that has to look attractive to a Jew who is honest and seeing what God is doing in the Gentile, to the Gentile people, and I pray it's the same for us today. We can apply that ourselves. Verse 15, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life 
from the dead. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. If the root is holy, the branches are too. A little bit. We understand kind of the analogy there, uh, but still a little bit complicated. Uh, but he's building on something here, and now he's going to get into it here in 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, okay, that's the Jewish, the olive uh, root and tree, and now he's saying that, that, that an olive tree is the most, I think, most valuable tree, uh, and, and this is imagery that has been used in the past, in the, I, I believe in the Old Testament as well. I probably should have looked that up. Um, but anyway, he's using that as an example. And so uh, they're broken off as they reject Christ. Uh, if the branches were broken off, and you, and now he's speaking to the Gentiles, being wild olive, us, wild olives, does that sound uh, good or typical? Yeah, okay, I was a wild olive. Uh, were grafted in among them, and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. And here, the Gentiles being grafted into the richness of God, the one true God, the God of all the universe, maker and creator of all things. It's just beautiful imagery here. We are grafted into the rich root of the olive tree. Verse 18, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you're arrogant, remember that it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And here, I, I've, this, is, this should be all of our theology. And it breaks my heart when I see uh, somebody and sometimes religious people uh, putting down the Jewish nation or Israel. Oh my, I wouldn't go there. Uh, be careful there. Uh, our arrogance uh, is not something I don't think God will take kindly to. In fact, Paul's going to set that up here. Uh, remember, it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. And so I think that we Gentile Christians should be never forget our roots and be uh, embrace and support uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Verse 20, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. You only stand by faith. That's it. Just by belief in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever be conceited and think you're something special beyond anyone else. You're not. You come by grace through faith from beginning to end. Amen? So let that, uh, never forget that. Verse 21, if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. This is really a uh, kind of profound here. Verse 22, behold then the kindness and severity of God. There are this, these two opposite ends here. To those who fell, severity. To the Jews who rejected Christ and salvation in Christ and righteousness through faith in Christ. But to you, Gentiles, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you'll be cut off. You get haughty and arrogant uh, towards God, towards the Jewish people or Jewish... Be very, very careful because you'll cross a line there. It looks to me like uh, when you will step out of grace and you will be stripped off of uh, the vine. That's what it looks to me like. Verse 23. And they also, the Jews, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. He never gives up on his people. And if they've chosen to reject him now, he's still open 
to bringing them back in again and grafting them right back in. Hallelujah. Praise him. And when I think about that, that incredible kindness of God, the incredible grace that God offers, I always think of the book of Revelation. Do you know that in the book of Revelation, you can still repent all the way up to Revelation chapter 16? That's like the sixth bowl of wrath right next to the very last one. And it still mentions, but they did not repent. Well, if it mentions they did not repent, then it implies that they could have repented. God is just staying it to, the, to the end. He's, he's offering his people, if they'll repent and turn to him, he will graft them back in. He'll graft us in, Gentiles. He'll graft Jews back in. Hallelujah. Praise him. Verse 24. If you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, that's us, okay? How much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? God wants that he wants his people. He wants his people. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. And this is, you know, Paul has set up just an incredible uh, thing here of how God is working at both ends, Gentile and Jew, to bring his people to saving faith in Christ. And it gets, it is a bit complicated. And uh, I looked at the message Bible here in the midst of all this complication. And I love the way Eugene Peterson translates it here at this point right here. Uh, here as he talks about uh, uh, this mystery. Here's how he translates it. Have you ever come to anything quite like this extravagant generosity of God? This deep, deep Wisdom? It's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Let's leave it at that. One, two. We're never going to figure this out. It's so beautiful and over our heads. Uh, verse 26. Are you ready for this now? So all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Now, I don't know exactly how to interpret that or what the standard interpretation of that is, but the way I read it is Jesus is coming back again. And he's going to reveal himself. It looks to me like first uh, to the line of Jacob. They're going to see the glorified and risen Christ and get their last and final opportunity to come to saving faith. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. I, I don't know. That's what it looks to me like that they're go Jesus is going to appear to them coming from Zion to remove ungodliness from Jacob. I believe that's the second coming of Jesus. I don't know what a... Uh, anyway, like Peterson says, we can't figure all this out. It's, the mystery is so deep and beautiful. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So in other words, uh, their rejection has led to us the gospel coming to us Gentiles, uh, but from the sake of the, the sake of the Father, they are still beloved and God's and beloved God's choice, and they have a special place with Him, and they should be and praise God for it. And if you have a good understanding of the whole Old Testament, you praising God for the Jewish people, uh, the, being the people that God brought through all this His plan of salvation up to Christ and through Christ. You can't praise God enough. Uh, for his working through uh, the Jewish people. Verse 29, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
and that works for the Jewish people. His calling on them is irrevocable. The same way for us, his calling on us is irrevocable. And I remember when Maggie Hall sent, wrote that letter and read it over me that night at John Linda Burris's house at, the, at prayer meeting. She quoted that verse right there. Marty, I have to look at it because I don't have it memorized. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable on your life. And so, so here's a, a word that she used because many of these verses have just many myriad of, of meanings and interpretations. And uh, she, God had revealed to her uh, that that also goes uh, for uh, his pastor, in my case. Uh, the, the gifts and calling of God are, I can't tell you what having that verse prayed over me did to me in my spirit as the spirit of God witnessed to my spirit. That's true. Move forward in your call uh, to pastor the church. For just as you once were disobedient to God, verse 30, but now you have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. Yes, okay, that's a Gentile Jew. Uh, kind of contrast here. Conundrum, I don't even know what to call it. Verse 31. So they also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. So mercy still available. And will be, looks to me like, to, to the end here. Uh, for God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. All. All the Gentiles. All the Jewish people. It's the same way everybody comes. It's mercy. But he had to shut them up so they could see what that looks like and be jealous and want to come uh, to him through the same way, through his mercy and grace and faith. It's a win-win in Stephen Covey's language in the seven habits of highly effective people. God has set up a win-win. And he hasn't compromised anything because salvation is by grace through faith. That's it. And it's the same for the Jews. It's the same for the Gentiles. Everybody's coming the same way. Verse 33, Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. God's way of joining all nations and peoples is incredible and beautiful. Verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Paul basically is saying, I've come to the end of my little finite brain that you can put in a cereal bowl. That's as far as I can go with this. It is so beautiful and so incredible. It is unfathomable. It is unsearchable how God has done this and is going to pull it off to complete fruition at the second coming of Christ. Paul says, time to stop. What can I say? From him, through him, and to him. Be the glory forever. Amen. Leave it to God for this incredible plan that he has that we get in on and get grafted into the olive tree, wild branches grafted in. Hallelujah and praise him. But he will graft back in his people, his remnant, a remnant that looks to me like explodes into Many, many myriad of millions and millions, we pray. Amen. How beautiful and unfathomable and unsearchable it is. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Romans chapter 11. Thank you for letting us get in on it and being grafted in uh, to, to you, to you, the, the tree, through Christ. 
we want to just, out of our love and thankfulness and out of your great mercy, we want to just love you and be obedient all the days of our lives and stay attached and grow stronger and stronger through Christ. And we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray for the Jewish people. We pray for our Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters right now. We pray uh, for their evangelistic efforts among their brothers and sisters, their Jewish brothers and sisters. Hear our prayers. And we look forward to the in-gathering that we read about here in Romans 11. Lord, as your people are gathered back up, uh, the tribe of Jacob, uh, for your great glory and for all eternity, uh, we live as brothers and sisters in Christ. We look forward to that day. And until that day, uh, we pray to serve you uh, out of just love and thanksgiving uh, of a new heart and as new creations through faith in Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. And I'll be on a little bit early tonight. I will pre-record about 6.30 because we have Leadership Board of Elders. Please pray for that meeting at 7 o'clock. Love y'all.